Namaskaram, and welcome to a special discussion with a person I have admired for very long. Her worldview on faith, ritual, text, and performative traditions have drawn me in again and again. Today, the topic for our discussion was given by our guest, Margari Mandalas. And I welcome Dr. Vasudha Narayanan to this forum. Dr. Narayanan is the Distinguished Professor, Department of Religion at the University of Florida in Gainesville. She's a past president of the American Academy of Religion, the first person from Asia to hold that prestigious post. She was educated in Madras, Bombay, and at Harvard University. Her fields of interest are the Hindu traditions of India, Cambodia, and America, and in the visual and expressive cultures in the study of Hinduism that intersects with gender issues. Dr. Narayanan is the author of several books, numerous articles, and has contributed to many encyclopedia entries. Former president of the Society for Hindu Christian Studies, Dr. Narayanan and the University of Florida have created America's first center for the study of Hindu traditions called Chitra. Dr. Narayanan Vasudha, welcome to our forum. Thank you so much for having me with you, Anita. It's a, it's a special treat having just gone through Margari and seen all the riches that has been provided by Andal's Gardens, all the fragrant flowers. It's a joy to be here today. I want to start off with the fact that it's Pongal and Margari is behind us and um, in Andal's world, she's uh, segued into her Natya Tirumuri, which is Tayyur Tingalum. She's drawing the mandalas on the floor. She wants to propitiate the God of love and she wants him to listen to her desires. But um, I just want you to tell us the significance of Margari and some of the points that you think are important to, uh, you know, to mention here. So when I was growing up, the major markers where well, Aryakudi is setting the whole Tirupave to music, and then Vaijanti Mala's dances. Oh, that for me was Andal coming alive. I still remember, I saw her in Raja Annamalai Mandram first, and then the Chitra Tirupave, which I'm showing on the screen now. And every picture, I'd mull over it and see what what the beauty of the verses were. I had no idea what the meaning was, of course, but this meant everything. And now, Anita, this last month, I've been reliving it in a very different way by looking at these beautiful illustrations which come, which have done by Kesha uh, for, you, for, your, for this particular month, and then have this come before the dances, the interpretation, the performative commentary on the entire Tirupave was very special. And the illustrations leading into it, this was like a, what they call, I would think, a drishti kavya. And here's a picture which I've always loved. It's a picture of Namarvar in the middle, one of the 12 Arvas, the poet's names who lived between the seventh and the ninth centuries. Andar was one of them. And Namarvar, who's also intricately connected with the month of Margari, because it is his long poems which are recited now and performed in many of the temples. And Namarvar here is flanked on one side by Madhurika Viyarva, his disciple. A real reversal in relationships. Supposedly, Madhurika Vi was a Brahmin, an older gentleman, and Namarva was supposedly of a quote-unquote, a lower caste, at least lower from the Brahminical viewpoint. 
and very young, 16 years old. And yet he becomes the teacher and Madhura Kavi is the disciple. But look what Madhura Kavi is holding in his hand, a stylus and a manuscript. And it is said as Namarvar was reciting the entire Thiruvai Muri, he was writing it down. And so too, even now, we have this whole tradition of oral vocal commentaries and written commentaries on the entire Divya Prabandham and Andar. But on the other side, and that's my favorite, is the first Acharya, the teacher of the Sri Vaishnava community, Nadamuni. Nadamuni has symbols in his hand, Talam Pural. And it is said that he, his nephew, started the Arya tradition, the performative commentaries. And so it is the two kinds of commentaries of interpretations that we have, the written and the performative. And the last month for me has been very special. It's been the performative commentaries that have come through through your magnificent dancers. And it's brought Andar to life, so to speak, to so many communities. I think, you know, one of the sad and distressing features is that Andal is simply not well known outside of um, Tamil Nadu. Many communities within Tamil Nadu have adopted her. And yet she doesn't have the kind of name recognition, you could say, that Meera has. And Meera has it, rightfully. But Andal too is, should take a position in the world stage. And I, it's, I wonder if what the dancers have done, what you have initiated here, like how Vaijayanti Mala brought it out to the public, the dancing. I wonder if this effort, what you've done in the last month um, with the multiple dancers of many kinds of Indian dance and other ways of experimenting will bring Andal on a world stage. And I wonder how others will react to her, how they will internalize her, and how she'll become part of the world literature scene. Well, I think, Vasudha, you and I both know that she deserves to be right up there. And I think, uh, and I hope that the past 30 days with so many different styles of dance, engaging with Tamil Bhakti poetry for the very first time, that they have made discoveries that I hope they will continue to explore. But I want to also um, remind you to tell us a little bit about, you know, the Niradal, the whole idea that uh, Andal ah. calls people to bathe. You know, there is a larger yes, significance absolutely. than just bathing. Yes, the intensity and the passion of Andal is just immense. Um, you know, we tend to kind of uh, make it sanitize this bhakti a little bit sometimes. But in Andal, you find a full-fledged, sensuous, every, every part of her body is valorized and she rejoices in it because it's all meant for God. And what does she want from that? The intensity, I think, uh, which comes out in some of the dances is all focuses on the word niradal. And we think of niradal as having a bath, going into the Yamuna. And people talk about uh, Katyayani Vratam and Tai niradal and taking a bath physically. Yes, it is a bath, but it is more than that. And, he, and people knew it then. It's not like she was hiding it. Pereva Chanpillai was a 13th century commentator. Now these commentators were quite Puritan and you know, very sensitive, but the sensuality and spirituality of Andar comes out so intensely in even Pereva Chanpillai's commentary. And he says, Niradal, Krishna Virahatal Pernada Thaba Margaret, that is, for it, for the fiery sensation of the separation, the agony of the separation from uh, Krishna. And that's cooled down by this Niradal. 
and it's quenched by this bath. What is it, Niradal? He says, when they think of Niradal, what is it? It's Krishna samsleshan, union, complete union. And it's not just mental, platonic, it's full body. And he, as if you didn't get the point, he makes it very clear in the next line. He says, Tamil people also, Tamil Argat, will refer to this Kalaivi union as Sunayada. That is, it's bathing in a mountain spring. And remember what the mountain spring is? It's um, the mountains, Kurinji are reflective of union in the Tamil Aindinai, uh, the five landscapes. So it's a signifier for that beautiful landscape itself. Now, they also take their cue here from the Brihadarani Upanishad. If that's the direction you want to go, I mean, it's right here in the Tamil songs, but if you really insist that, oh, no, no, it should be in the Vedas, it should be in, in the Sanskrit literature, it's there too. And they um, talk about the line from the Brihadarani Upanishad, in which says, as a, as a man embraced by a woman he loves, is oblivious to anything else. And so Andar and her friends in the shared vision of going together to be with Krishna, they're talking about something very intense. And I think it's in this, um, in this passion, this, um, this longing to belong to Krishna. I think that's where we can truly claim her as a person who many religion, many people of faith can, can understand and that's where they can come to her from that side really interesting vasudha because uh, what you just said it's such a beautiful metaphor you know the fiery uh, fiery desire that burns in a young young girl's body and the act of niradal is that union with krishna physical union with krishna that quenches that desire and i think it's beautifully uh, beautifully said and illuminated by you thank you so much for that but can i just now just share one incident which is also about aryakuri ramanuj aingar and the tirupave he used to sing the tirupave uh, casually maybe as a virittam with alapana but then uh, the late uh, pontiff of kanchipuram mahapiriva who was also a great Andal devotee and admirer, he urged Aryakuri to set all the Tirpaves. He said, why don't you just do that? Aryakuri initially, as the story goes, was a bit hesitant because he said, even in the Tirpave, this young girl has made some allusions to breasts and to the goddesses, uh, Napinne's perfect round breasts and uh, Perumal sleeping on the breasts. So he was a little hesitant. And at which point Mahapiriva is supposed to have said, if Andal herself has written it and she herself has imagined it, who are you and I to question her? So go ahead and do it. So I think True. that was, uh, <laughs> it's really a charming story. But my next question to you is what happened to Andal's Vishnu? And how did his foot, when he, Ongi Ulagalanda, she says in the third Pasharam, how did he burst the boundaries of India? and travel as widely as he did. Tell uh, us that story. Uh, well, that's my favorite part, actually. Well, uh, quite apart from the fact that Vishnu, the word Vishnu itself means um, all pervasive, imminent in every nanoparticle of the universe, and that he is transcendent and imminent in everything. So the word itself indicates that. So when you speak about Vishnu, the all-pervasive, spatially all-pervasive one, reclining on Ananta, the coils of time, infinity. So when you see an Ananta Shayana image, immediately in your mind, you think of mastery over space and time because Ananta is infinity by way of time and Vishnu is all-pervasive. And yet, what we have here is a Vishnu who, as a human being, and as an avatara, and as a transcendent one, has become an NRI, and moved on to other countries right from the beginning. And I'd like to share with you some of how 
Andal of how Andal actually, um, I thought of Andal so many times when I was doing my research in Cambodia. And particularly when it comes to this part about how he is actually um, Ongi Ulagaranda Uttaman Pair Party when she says that. And that's what I saw here in this very beautiful Vishnu temple in Cambodia. It's near Sembri. It's called Prasad Kravan. It was built by a member of the nobility around the 10th century. And it, outside that, I had the privilege of seeing some beautiful dancers one year in the night. And these dancers made the whole thing come to life as they stepped out of the Vishnu temple. And what was inside the temple? It was Ongi Ulagaranda Uttaman, that Lord. And this person whom they call Trilokyanatha here is Trivikrama. But notice the difference in Trivikrama that you find in Southeast Asia. His hands, his legs, his right leg is just gently uplifted and Bhuma Devi is offering a, a, a lotus plant, a lotus flower for him to keep his foot, to rest his foot. And you find that in stark contrast with how uh, Trivikrama is depicted say here in Mahabalipuram and that is the leg is at right angle. But in Cambodia, you find Trivikrama, but ever so gentle, so as not to hurt Bhuma Devi, <laughs> almost in a caressing way, and not to show his might, but his love. So here, on one side, you find Trivikrama with his leg outstretched, but that you find in Vaikuntha Permal Temple. And I'll come back to this temple. It's my favorite temple in Kanchipuram. And on the other side, you find Trivikrama very gently with his legs lifted. Now, that actually is an important feature, I would think, in Cambodian art. And that is, you find something they take from India or from the rest of the world, and then they make it their own. They use their agency in like talking about it in their own terms, in ways in which it makes sense to them. And I think that is just a marvelous way in which you can think of Trivikrama or any other feature of Indian civilization that you find in Cambodia. Vasudha, um, what are the avatars of Vishnu that are popular in Southeast Asia? Ah, uh, many of them are there, of course. And Vishnu goes there as in many forms. But before I go into the avatars, can I just talk about Vishnu as he's presented there, Narayana, so to speak, um, and talk about how he is represented in Cambodia. Now I should say that to a large degree, uh, <clears throat> Vishnu is seen, uh, Vishnu's uh, worship is not perhaps as popular as um, Shiva, and you find more of Shiva. But then you could say, you can also ask me, how did this begin? How did Trivikrama get there? Yes, we, he lifted one leg and he was there. And so before I go into talking about all the different forms of Vishnu and avatars, I'd like to talk briefly about how, how the Indian civilization even get there. Well, Cambodia, of course, comes from the word Kambuja, born of Kambu. And the earliest references we have from it and the earliest um, origin stories speak about a descent of an Indian prince or an Indian sage, Kambu is one name, or an Indian prince who goes to Southeast Asia, it meets a Naga princess, and then um, we have the next, uh, we have the, the children being born, and that is Kambuja. Historically though, and I love this, the earliest recorded inscription we find 
is that about that done with the, by a queen, a woman. In the year around circa um, 475, her name was Kula Prabhavati in Cambodia. And she actually, the Sanskrit inscription, which, and this is the Sanskrit inscription, which records it, speaks about her donation to the hermitage of the Seishasai, he who is reclining on the, on the snake. And her son Gunavarman actually thinks, uh, speaks of himself as being of the Kaundinya Vamsha. And he endows money to Vishnupada and Chakratirtha. Now, according to many of the Thai and uh, Cambodian sources, Buddhism comes right from India and spreads all over Southeast Asia. Along with Buddhism, so did Hinduism. And I think many of the kings in Cambodia and in Thailand actually invited people from India to come there, sculptors, learned people to come there and they wanted to be in power. So anything they could do to push up their balls to their power, they would get the help from India and India and the rest of the world. But one thing you should keep in mind is that cultural relationships are always reciprocal. So we shouldn't think of it as a one-way flow from India and that Cambodia was a passive uh, absorber of everything that came from the subcontinent. I think it goes both ways, but it's harder to find Southeast Asian influences in India. The earliest historical records speak about Funan and Chenla, large empires. But when I'm speaking about the Khmer Empire, I should speak about a large swath of land in Southeast Asia. So when I speak about Vishnu there, I should speak about Vishnu, like in many parts of other countries like Laos, um, Thailand, Myanmar, and so on, all of that came under the Khmer Empire. Today, it's a very small, you can see it with a red arrow, Cambodia is quite small, but the earliest parts of it were in like other parts of uh, Southeast Asia. Take Lao, for instance, um, the Wat Pu mountain was called Linga Parvata. Mm -hmm. And there actually you find beautiful icons of, it's, in, it's a dilapidated, but um, you find beautiful icons of uh, Vishnu, Trimurti, as well as the churning of the ocean of milk. And you find an inscription, which is now in a museum nearby um, in Ubon Rachetani. Uh, Rachetani meaning uh, that this is really uh, Raj, uh, Rajdhani and Ubon is the lotus flower. And there you find a beautiful inscription in, in the Pallava uh, writing. So we find a very strong Pallava connection here. And the writing is Vattarita. And it shows, and it says clearly that a king there in Cambodia called himself Mahendra Varman or Chitrasena. And that's the same combination that you find in the Pallava uh, country also. A king called Mahendra Varman called himself Chitrasena. And then the longest Sanskrit inscription in the world, in the world, is not in India. It was actually in the Khmer Empire in Cambodia. It's today in Thailand, in, in the National Library, it's called the Stokok Dogma inscription. And the look at the inscriptions, it's all Vattarita. It's very closely connected to um, Kannada, Telugu, and Andamari. It's, uh, the, the writing is very, very close. So yes. whether it's inscriptions, sculptures, this large temple in, uh, near Rako, Nakorachisima to Shiva, you find a lot of connections with, with India. Historically though, the Angkor period begins around the early ninth century when Jayavarman II, look at the names, Jayavarman, Mahendravarman, uh, Udayadityavarman, Suryavarman, very Indianized, Sanskritized names. But Jayavarman um, established the Kambuja Angkorian empire and his first um, capital was Hariharalaya. Uh, the name itself is beautiful. And it's from that period that you have the Angkor um, age that begins. Now, the Angkor uh, Wat, we don't know the original name, it's near Siem Reap um, in Cambodia. And Angkor was the local pronunciation of, um, of Nagara. And Wat is from Vatika. 
and it was built by Surya Varman II and dedicated to Vishnu. And this, the temple, as I, I want to share with you today, is all about the sun. So Surya Varman is not simply a name, Surya. It's, uh, he's the builder of Angkor Wat, and he's there right there. Now, when you look at the tower, it looks like um, Bhubaneshwar. Look at this. It's very similar. It's a Panchayatna temple, four corner te um, uh, towers with a central tower. So the Angkor people were really in the business of, in the, in the global marketplace, they would go and they buy, you know, pick up the best features uh, in architecture. But really, this is mind blowing to me that the Vaikuntha Permal temple in Kanchipuram and Angkor Wat are the only two temples in the entire world, in Vishnu temples, which face west and which have three floors. So there's a close, I mean, the Vaikuntha Permal temple was built in 770 and it was built by uh, Nandi Varman, the second, a Pallava king, 770. So, and when was Angkor built? 1130, around that time. So Angkor took this pattern, west facing, they were very specific about why they did it and how they did it. Most temples faced east, but Kanchipuram, the, many of the Vishnu temples face west, when you think about it. Go there and see um, even the rituals in Varadaraja Pirmal temple, Yatoktakari, all begin, they're all facing west. And here in Angkor, and in all other temples in Cambodia, what do you find? Dancing, halls of dancers. Everywhere you go, you find, and they call, they use the word Apsara. They say Apsara's dancing in Bayon, everywhere. And I think it's through the performing arts that much of our stories, many of them really went into Cambodia. And look at the, the, the legs, the knees, how they have held so typical of the dances from the east coast of India, so to speak. And it's on the other side, you find a dancing Shiva from Aihole, which is also with those kinds of feet. Reclining Vishnus were also common. This is from uh, Vietnam. And anywhere they found water, they would put a Vishnu there. So when you find, when you think about Andar, and her speaking about Paramanadi Padi in the second verse of the Tirupavai, Parkadal, that a body of water or even an artificial, this is the largest reservoir um, mankind had created uh, in the 10th century, the Western Mayborn. And in the middle of that, they had a huge reclining Vishnu. We only have the top part of it now in bronze, and that's a reclining Vishnu here, which is now in the, in the museum. And other parts, Kabal Spien, near um, Siem Reap, it was considered to be a kind of Ganga, this river. And in the middle of that, you find Vishnu, and look at the water flowing over the toe of Vishnu, following the Puranic kind of diktat there. And you find this, reverse reclining Vishnu. By that I mean, the other side, the head is not on normal side like Sri Rangam, but the other side. Now, if you hold Sri Rangam as an exception for facing South, in general, whether it's India or Cambodia, if a Vishnu, reclining Vishnu is facing West or South, the head is in the opposite direction. And that's for the welfare of the community, so to speak. So um, whether you go to Yatoktakari, that is Chonnamannam Shaida Permal Temple in Kanchipuram, or on the right-hand side, you find a huge one um, out in the middle of the fields um, in South Arkad district. That Vishnu, who is on the reverse reclining position, was facing south. And so in Mahabalipuram, where he's facing north, it's the normal direction. But in the Yatoktakari temple, the opposite side. Vishnu Chaturbhuja was also important, that is having four arms, and Vishnu with eight arms. 
the Etam Vishnu Ashtabhujakaram in Kanchipuram, again, so I keep coming back to a Kanchipuram nexus here to talk about Vishnu and to talk about the, the, the sculptures, the sculptural programming in Angkor. And the Etam Vishnu, and when I went to see him here in the um, museum, they were renovating the sculpture. Uh, he was really important in the early Cambodian times. And then you also had the four-armed Vishnu. But notice this particular Vishnu has a maze which looks like a baseball bat. Can you see that? Yes. And I thought that was just <laughs> amazing. So that's the kind of main Vishnus that you would find in Cambodia. And you would, I would think that every one of them is handsome enough for Andar to fall in love with. <laughs> but of all the stories of Vishnu, uh, Vasudha, is there one single story that is especially important to them? Well, yes, there is. But just as Andar moves between different incarnations, you find many kinds of incarnations here also in, um, in uh, Cambodia. So what you would find is um, <clears throat> uh, Vishnu in multiple positions. And we find, as I told you, Trivikrama and so on. And then we find, as we keep going, we will find more and more incarnations coming in. But the earliest incarnations, I would say, in Cambodia are those, those depictions of, of all that we can think of. Um, and let me get here. Sita um, and Hanuman and Ashokavana, Rama, Avatara, Vali is really big. Vali, and I'll come back to Vali. Some of the people in Cambodia seem to have had a real, real affection for Vali. But the earliest ones are Krishna, Krishna Govardhana. By, by the seventh century, Krishna is there. And Krishna Govardhana keeps coming up over and over again in Cambodia. And here are scenes of Krishna's life in a temple called Bapun. And the first one shows Devaki and Vasudeva mourning because the child is being taken away by Kamsa. And the next panel shows horizontally comes our servants throwing the child. And then you find Kali and Ardhanam. Strangely enough, actually, you don't find too many Kali and Ardhanams in, um, in, in Angkor. And I think part of it is because they really worship the snake quite a bit. But the special incarnation, and you know, you've seen this. This is in the Bangkok airport. Quite correct. And it's the churning of the ocean of milk. Like instead of all the nidhis that came out of uh, the Samudra Mantanam, you find Chanel and Gucci here. That's what you would find. But although this is in Thailand, this is not really a big story for the Thai people. And you find Vishnu right in the middle of the departure lounge in Bangkok, Swarnabhumi Airport. But this is not such a big story in, in um, Thailand. It is huge in Cambodia. And of course, Andal refers to this over and over again. And there are at least four major kinds of interventions when she mentions um, the churning and the uh, Kurma Avatara. The most famous, of course, is Vanga Kadal Kadenda Madhavanai Keshavna. Even if you don't know Tirpave, that one verse, people, everyone knows that. Manga kadal kadendam. So that particular verse. And then Shindura Shempuripot. And in that also, the same story of Mandara, which is used as a churning rock. It is such a national story, Anita, that this is the symbol outside the Cambodian embassy in Washington, D.C. 
And it's such a wow. small story in India, but a huge story in Cambodia, which means that they have been using their own agents in picking and choosing whatever they wanted to show why it's important to them. And this story, and I'm quickly going to go through a number of slides of the churning to show you why it's so significant for them. And it's on top of lintels, on top of doorways. Because as you enter the doorway, it's an auspicious symbol with all the nidhis that came out of it. It's on bridges leading to towns. And again, that is auspicious. Huge, and sometimes you have to search through, it's almost like Indiana Jones wannabe territory to this kind of places to go underneath. And I literally had to swing through these vines to get here to see, and this was my Amrita, to see the churning of the ocean of milk story. And you can ask, why is this important? You find it on the pavement. People are selling it. It's an election symbol, but the good versus bad. And of course, we, you know, that's easy to understand in an election. Um, outside hotels, and when they built a memorial park to honor all those who died in the Vietnam War and by killed by the Khmer Rouge um, under Pol Pot, when they built a memorial park, they have thousands of stories to choose from, from Hinduism and Buddhism. But they chose this story to circle the entire memorial park, which is fascinating to me that they would choose it. So obviously, the meaning for this would, would have changed over and over again. Look at the symmetrical number of devas and asuras or not. This is in Angkor Wat. On the eastern side, the churning of the ocean of milk is the largest bar relief in the world. So when Antal says, Vanga Kadal Kadena Madhavana Keshavana, it is here that we find this beauty. But what is interesting about this? is that it has so many different meanings. It legitimates kingship because Rajya Lakshmi comes from it. It shows the importance of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. There's a very didactic meaning, an uneasy friendship with the Asuras. And here in the inscriptions, they call them the charms. It has a calendar function. The number of devas and Asuras on both sides here are the number of days between like the spring equinox and the summer solstice, things like that. So it's very precise. Then of course, we think of churning for Soma. Above all, this is the first story that's ever danced in the Nati Shastra, ever. Yeah. If you look at the Nati Shastra, this is the first story. And then it speaks of also about the importance of the snake Vasuki because that's the progenitor of the Cambodian people. And then the guarding of the Nidhis inside the holy towns. It could be metaphor, internal, it could be allegorical. It could be the rising of the Siddhis within you. If you take an internal notion of the mind, all the churning happened within you, out there comes. And then the significance of the sea and the maritime exercises, as Andal herself says, Vanga Kadal and Vanga Kadal Vanga would have so many meanings. It could mean wave, it could mean Bengal, it could mean ships, it could mean so many things. Above all, the story is so important for every human being because in the context of the story coming in Ramayana is that they ask, how can we be immortal free of old age and disease? And that is a question we're still asking, aren't we? How can we be free of disease in today and age? But this part I loved because it shows a very clear connection with South India. And only, and here I'm speaking about South India specifically. The slide itself is not very clear because the, the sculpture is worn out. At the end, of the churning of the ocean of milk in Angkor Wat, you find a monkey, a large monkey. You can ask, why, why did the monkey come here? And you know, the guides will tell you, oh, it's Hanuman, it's this, that. And it's not. 
I mean, and for 10 or 15 years, I struggled with where, did, where who is this monkey? Each time I'd go there and I'd be going every year, I keep looking at the monkey, who are you? And then, you know, I had a Eureka moment. It comes from Kamban. And in Kamban, he says, That is, he, Vali, stood with the devas and the demons and Mandara's form was worn out with a chill and the wrathful snake was hissing fire and Vali with strong shoulders churned the swirling sea. And then he, in another place, Kampan also says, Vali, who's older than Shugriva, is the victorious one who tied Ravana to his tail and then he jumped in the eight directions. And he, the one with strong arms, used as a churning rod, the mountain circled by the snake. And he churned it until the nectar rose. And this is so nice. It speaks about how the towering mantra was the churning rod. Vasuki, who has no end, was a churning rope. You find this even in uh, as early as Shilaparigara. Vadamadare, uh, 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 Mattaki, Vasuki, Nanaki, and all that. But now, here, it's a beautiful and uh, a scene of pathos, um, Anita. It's one which melts your heart. That morning, the second day, Sugriva is calling Vali to a fight. And Tara is beseeching Vali, saying, Tara says, his wife says, don't go. You walloped him yesterday. If he's calling you again today, there's something amiss. There's something wrong. Don't go. She has the right instincts. And she says, don't go. And Vali, arrogant. He says, Maili el kuyel muri. As beautiful as a peacock, Koyal Marie, sweet as a coil. Don't forget, I was the person who churned the ocean of mill and got the nectar out. And then he stomps out. And you know what happens after that. And that's the sad part. But what is in Kamban is seen here in the scene in Patadakal, in Karnataka. Where in the top panel, you will find a monkey-like figure pulling the snake, Vali. And also in, uh, you don't have to read this, so let me just summarize it for you. In the Ranganada Ramayana, in Telugu literature, very clearly they put Vali in the scene of the churning of the ocean of milk. And then, in Kerala dances, in the Tayyam songs, you find that Tara, Vali's wife, saying, come on, this is where Mandara was lowered deep. So Vali helping in the churning story is alluded to even in the archaic dance Tayyam pieces. And it gets expanded in the other songs, even in the Kathakali plays and especially valorized later on. So what, what I would like to suggest is that there was a strong link between South India and particularly um, the people who built Angkor had the same sources that Kamban and others had. Not that necessarily one influenced the other, it could have been, but they had access to the same kind of sources. And here is this panel of the churning of the ocean of milk and on spring equinox day, I ran behind to the eastern side from the front. And this rising sun comes directly, it falls on Kurma, on Kurma Avatara, exactly the rising sun falls on the person whom Andal sings about as Vanga Kadal Kadenda Madhavane Keshavane. And it is the Kurma and he who is doing it. But Margari, Uttarayana Punyakala has begun. 
with this. This is the winter solstice for us. Okay, it, it's December 21st in most parts of the world and for us too. But over the centuries, there's something called a precession of equinoxes. So what happens is that um, the date gets shifted and we never did go back and adjust the January 14th day to the winter solstice. But if you remember the Mahabharata, this is where Bhishma waits for the Uttarayana Punyakala to begin to give up his life. So one year, I thought if this building of this Angkor Wat would be just right according to astronomical measurement, maybe something's going on with Bhishma statues, the, the, the sculpture is there. And as soon as you go into Angkor Wat, on the right hand side, you find a huge, huge, like about 40 something meters wide of the Mahabharata wall. And here you find a beautiful sculpture of Bhishma on the bed of arrows. And next to him, you can see five brothers, the Pancha Pandavas. You can see Bhishma here marked with a red arrow and the five Pandavas with a blue arrow here. And of course, that's where they are, even when they ask about um, the rules of governance and so on. And the Vishnu Sahasranama is said right here on his uh, bed of arrows. And on winter solstice, the time when he gives up his life, when the Uttarayana Punyakala begins, the sun falls on him. I was amazed to see this, that it's really so carefully carved. And all that becomes part of the Margari uh, panel, uh, the Margari mandalas. On the one hand, you find Vishnu, Bhishma, Namarvar, Andal, every, everything converges together in the end of uh, this time. Thank you, Vasta. That's absolutely fascinating. Brings me back memories of when I went to Siam Reap. And I saw a lot in Angkor Wat. I went back so many times, sunrise, sunset. But I think that's a temple you can never finish really seeing and experiencing. But with all the magnificence and the omnipresence of Vishnu, I want to wind back now to our favorite Andal. You know, she took such liberties with her Krishna Narayana. And this person the great lord, the Partha, uh, the charioteer of Arjuna uh, in the Mahabharata. And she, she berates him. She calls him a thief. She calls him a liar. She calls him, what do you know about truth? I think, what do you know about dharma? I find that fascinating about her, yes. you know? Yes. And let me share a particular verse from Nachya Tirumuri, which is my favorite. But, you know, with, I, I spoke to you a minute back about Bhishma, waiting for the Uttarayana Punyakala. This is the time when Thai Masam begins in the Tamil calendar, and, and we call it Shankaranti. Of course, the word Shankaranti simply means meet coming together, meeting and so on. And it's when there's a transition from one Rasi to another. And that word becomes very popular in Southeast Asia. For us, actually, there are many Shankarantis through the month, through the year, but we only call this one Pongala Shankaranti. But that word of the shifting, so to speak, and the, when the meeting comes and you move to the next Rasi, since that comes every month, in Southeast Asia, um, the New Year Day, which comes same time as our calendar, Tamil calendar, middle of April, April 13, 14, 15, they call it Songran. Yes. Short for uh, Shankaranti. And that's part of it too. But with this comes a real shifting of energies for Andar. So she's, she's spoken about the Tirupave. She's come, she feels that good things are gonna happen. And in some temples in South India on Bogi day, she gets married to the Lord. In some on Pongal day, 
one time also. But in the Nachiya Thirumari, she is beginning and she says, Tayyora Tingal, she begins. She's drawing mandalas in sand. And think of a mandala, think of the columns we draw. They're so fleeting. You draw them, the, the, you create this work of beauty in the morning and it's gone by afternoon. Or 10 seconds later, a lorry is walking, going right over it. And yet that doesn't stop that person from drawing the most beautiful mandala. And in a sense, Andal has done this vradam, it's beautiful. And it's like Krishna is, Krishna is going roughshod over her, doesn't show up, comes when he wants. And she goes through this, as you know, in the Nachar Tirumari, and as we've seen in the last month, with so many dances in the evening, the dances of agony, of separation and the ecstasies of the union. And then she comes into Varanamayiram. And when she comes to Varanamayiram, she imagines the most glorious thing that she's marrying this wonderful God of hers. Um, you know, I remember when I was studying that with Perevachan's comment, uh, Pillai's commentary on Tirupavai and um, also here, um, I was studying it with a wonderful professor called Professor C. Jagannath Acharya, who was in Vivekananda College and he lived in Triplicane and I'd go every morning to learn from him. And there he was still, and apparently Kamala Lakshman had come to him to hear the meaning of Varanamayiram before she completely, she danced it. And I'm not sure when it was, maybe 50s, 60s. And he was explaining to me how he explained to her. And he's, when it comes to the verse, Matthalam Kotta Varishangam Nindruda, Muttudai Tamam Niraitanda Pandarkar, Maitunan Nambi Madhusudan Vandane, Kaitalam Patra Kanakandain Tovina. And later on, says, Kaimel Enkai Vaita. And he says that the first moment of physical contact, and he speaks about this kind of electricity that goes through this young girl when his hand touches hers. This is the transcendent Lord. Remember, he's Vishnu, the one who is in the force of the universe, what even Star Wars calls the force, so to speak. And here she has anthropomorphized him. She's, he's in the temple. He's come and he touches her and, and the feeling of ecstasy just that minute that her, his hand touches. And when he spoke about it so many years later, I mean, he was more than 70 then explaining this. My, I had goosebumps, just the way in which, and that is the kind of ecstasy we shouldn't forget. The joy that Andal brings and is able to convey. But then after that, immediately after that is the Veraha. Soon after that comes a very plaintive cry to Panchajanya, Karpuram Narumo, Kamalapu Narumo. And she's, tell me, Ari Venchange, you know, tell me. And this going up and down and then sending messengers to Tiruvenkadam. And finally, she's like, what is happening? And towards the end, on the 14th set of poems, are some of the most tranquil, I would say, poems, in which this intimacy, this joy, this teasing, but there's a sense of equilibrium that comes about. And yet you shouldn't forget that in this intimacy, there's also some transgression and I'd like to share those verses with you, if I may, uh, to show how exactly she does it. You see the different mandalas of Pongal. And then what we have here, when we go on, is the last set of poems, one verse that I've chosen, which is one of my favorite. Daruma Maria Kurumbanai Tankai Sharngam Maduve Pol 
உருவ வட்டம் அழகிய பொருத்தம் எலிய கண்டீரே உருவு கரிதாய் முகம் செய்தாய் உதய பருவத்தின் மேல் விரியும் கதிரே போல் வானை விருந்தா வனத்தில் கண்டேனே ஹீஸ் அ பிரான்ஸ்ட குறும்பன் ஹூ நோஸ் நோ தர்மா தருமம் அறியா குறும்பனே ஹீ நோஸ் நோ தர்மா and his eyebrows arch like the bow saranga in the sand remember earlier on he sp- she spoke about kamsa's thick eyebrows and so so on in achar tirumavi but now she's talking about the delicate arch like a will like a bow he's a handsome one have you seen him she's asking her friends remember her friends went with her in tirupave every one of them she woke them up and dragged them na na da na ude ya come on let's go and she's come back to them and she asks kandire have you seen him and he said and they say what do they reply and this is where we know she has reached she's been fulfilled his form is dark his face glows bright like the sun that fans remember how little children draw a sun Udaya Suryan, like the sun that fans on the peaks of the rising hills. We've seen him here. Vrinda vanatil kandu me. But this is the God. She says, Dharma Maria, you have no Dharma. And yet, who is this God she's talking about? This is the God whom we know. who said in the bhagavad gita dharma samsthapana tharya sambhavami yuge yuge and yet what do we have here an andar who just throws it to the wind one can you tell you dharma you are playing fast and loose with us so how, how you know you're just teasing us all the time and that's the beauty of it to bring it back but now what we have here in the tirva in the end of the nachar tirumuri is a sense of herself um feeling that no there's a calmness this nequilibri and i feel that this is something that all of us can get or ought to get strive to get that life is fleeting like the mandalas like the columns we draw and yet that doesn't stop the person who's drawing it on the ground from drawing creating that sense of beauty and our lives are so fleeting particularly now in this covid times we are so aware about the fragility of life and yet we shouldn't stop the creating the beauty the kind of beauty that you saw in natya tirumuri and in the tirupavai for the last month so oh thank you so much anita for allowing me to share the different facets of andal that i could within the few minutes and also if i had to retitle this i think i would call it andal in anchor and how they probably were thinking about andal in writing be writing about in drawing these sculptures i want to thank you uh, vasudha because i always thought Andal didn't travel physically too much but her mind and her imagination traveled so much but Andal's Vishnu really traveled traveled across the oceans across geographical terrain and into cultural dna of uh, you've said Thailand and especially Cambodia which is your area of interest and thank you for this fascinating journey it just piques my interest and i hope it's piqued the interest of viewers and uh, i'm ever so grateful because it's been such a wonderful conclusion to our month long series and i think a little window is opened for further exploration and searching thank you so so very much namaste thank you